And now for something completely different. Forget everything you've been told by others before. Get ready for the real deal. The full story. Real talk about money, markets, life. Now, it's The Real Investment Show with Lance Roberts. Presented by RIA Advisors. And good morning. It's the uh, pre-Friday Eve edition of The Real Investment Show. I'm your host, Lance Roberts. Uh, We've got a lot of stuff to talk about today. Obviously, the Fed yesterday. What did they say? What didn't they say? What's going on here? What's going to happen next? Those are all the big questions. Michael Lieb with CFA is going to join me this morning here in about 15 minutes, and we're going to get into that. Talk about that into some detail. Um, obviously, as we continue to kind of get into you know uh, this big week of earnings season after the bell today, lots of big tech companies coming out to report their earnings. That'll obviously have an impact on markets as we kind of wind up this week. But going into next week, those number of earnings start to run off, and there's a lot of other kind of economic news that's now starting to show signs of weakness. In fact, I wanted to go through a few of those things this morning with you that have kind of really popped up on the radar and something to be thinking about here now as we get into August and September. As we've talked about here recently, August and September are probably going to be tougher months for both the economy as well as for the financial markets as really kind of these two start to collide um, you know, uh, in the next couple of months. Um, the first thing is, as we look at this, is that this is the, the Phillips curve, basically, which compares the employment population uh, ratio and inflation relative to Fed funds rates. So the question is, is when is the Federal Reserve actually going to raise interest rates? The answer is actually never, because <laughs> if the Fed raises interest rates, and we saw this during 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, Interest rates remain near zero, even though we had population growth, even though we had employment growth, even though we had some minor forms of inflation, they kept interest rates at an extremely low level, and we barely got any economic growth at all. We were basically running at what is considered to be escape velocity. On an inflation-adjusted basis, we're running right about 2%. You've got to be above 2% economic growth on an inflation-adjusted basis to absorb population growth. And we really never got much above that. So the reality is, is that most likely over the course of the next decade, uh, there's going to be very little incentive here for the Fed to actually raise interest rates. And this really comes at a time where we're talking about a $5 trillion deficit, ultimately, when we get through more bailouts. Um, and the fact that we're carrying almost $75 trillion in total debt, you simply cannot raise rates in that environment. Talking on the employment front, though, since we're talking about employment here, uh, it's interesting when you take a look at how many people are now unemployed, receiving no pay, and not retired. That number is now 62 million people, and that is actually down from 65 million people back in, in May of this year. But we are, not, we are not seeing a real recovery here. While well, we see employment numbers come up that say, you know, hey, we hired 2.5 million people, we hired 3 million people, etc. There are still a large number of individuals that are unemployed without pay, and that number has actually been rising over the last couple of weeks. So employment numbers are probably going to be weaker over the next couple of months because we're already starting to see uh, the impact of companies starting to reverse reopening, starting to slow down hiring, etc. Also, I mean, here and here you can really take a look at this a little bit better. This is the Household Pulse Survey, and this was from Ms. Shedlock this morning. Uh, the number of employed has actually dropped here from 134 million to 130 million. So about 4 million people have now come off the rolls again. Now, if you've ever been wondering about what is the difference between the unemployment benefit claims and what these enhanced benefits are, the $600 a week, this is what it looks like. Going back to 2000, this lower line here is is the $291 per claimant per week, and that was the average back in 2018. This is the current $809 a week that people, this is that extra $600 check that people are getting right now. And when you wanna ask yourself the question why people aren't going back to work, here's the answer. <laughs> so when you're making this much more money, you're making more money now than you were actually actually working. So because remember, this is the actual unemployment benefit claim is based on your previous uh, income. So when you're seeing this big of a jump, this is why there's been a lot of concern over people not going back to work. They're receiving more benefits. This is why you're seeing, you know, um, retail sales actually doing very well because people are getting a lot of extra money here. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is all those benefits just ran out today. 
because we haven't passed any uh, type of extension here on the bill. And those unemployment benefits actually ended today. And uh, the big question for the White House is going to be, what do they do here? The bill between the House and, and the Senate has now stalled. There's no progress on that right now. President Trump's talking about maybe doing a short term extension with what he can do um, on an executive order basis. But until they get something figured out here, uh, there's potential risk to the economy and to the markets, uh, potentially short term, as that extra $600 a week. Now, that's $2,400 a month that goes away. Back to the markets here real quick. The last time that we saw as much options activity as we see right now actually in the tech sector, these big names that are reporting after the bell today, was back in January of this year. I'm not saying anything, but, you know, <laughs> when you get this much exuberance, so to speak, within a particular area of the market, uh, those tend to be kind of peaks in the markets. And, and this is why we talked about about three weeks ago. Uh, we said, hey, you know, we're trimming our tech exposure here a little bit, reducing some of our, some of our gain, you know, taking some of our gains off the table. Big runs there. Lots of exuberance here in the sector. So, again, there's a real big potential here, even with earnings coming out tonight, that there could be some disappointment and performance tomorrow. And so we're going to take a little bit of attention to that. Um, also, I've talked about before about earnings season, talking about earnings. Earnings season is millennial soccer, right? We lower the rate, the, you know, the earnings levels low enough, and then all of a sudden, all these companies beat. And this is why you always get a 70% beat rate. Well, look at this, 85% beat rate because we lowered estimates so much going into this earnings season. Uh, all the companies are beating. Now, they're beating much lowered estimates, right? So, you know, it's it's not that they're actually making more money and they're being more profitable, et cetera. Actually, when you take a look at the makeup, it's primarily the top big five mega cap names right now, the ones that are driving the NASDAQ market that are making up about 80% of earnings and sales uh, for the whole index itself. So, you know, really the, the actual density of earnings and the, and the real profitability of these companies has fallen markedly. But yes, um, if you take the hurdle and you lay it on the ground, it's really easy for people to get over it. And that's what you're seeing here uh, as, as we go through this. So um, last thing here is uh, we talked about earlier this week that we begun taking on a little bit of long dollar exposure here. We trimmed back on our international. We also reduced our gold exposure. Oh my gosh, that's that's heresy right now in the markets. But um, our good friends over at Sentiment Trader did a good analysis uh, on this this morning, which actually confirmed why we've been, and we talked about this earlier this week, but any time that dollar exposure has been this negative, um, basically over every time frame going forward, gold has not performed well over the course of the next year. So again, here's gold going up at a peak and the, at a time when it's combined with very, very low dollar exposure. In other words, everybody's bearish on the dollar where we are right now. That has been actually a peak in gold prices. So it doesn't mean today or tomorrow, but when you have this much of a negative pressure on any asset class and people and, and when you start seeing it on every media outlet cnbc fox news everybody's talking about the dollar going down uh, we're about to lose reserve currency status that's typically a, at least a short-term bottom in the dollar so that's why we add a little bit of dollar exposure to, to our portfolios reduce some of our risk there and, and again begin to uh, really kind of petition uh, you know base ourselves for a bit of a reflexive rally in the market. So, all right, um, quick break. We're going to come back. I'm your host, Lance Roberts. We're going to pick up with Michael Leibowitz, talk all about Fed and uh, what did they say yesterday, what didn't they say, and what does it all mean. That's coming up next right here on The Real Investment Show. Don't go away. Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet. Sign up for the Real Investment Report now at realinvestmentadvice.com. Baby shot. Baby shot. Baby shot. Baby shot. Mommy shot. Mommy shot. Mommy shot. Mommy shot. Daddy shot. And welcome back to the show this morning. I'm your host, Lance Roberts. Michael Leibowitz, CFA, joining us live from his bunker up in Maryland, you know, where uh, 
Everybody's kind of everybody's trying Where to survive. The, well, everybody's trying to survive the fallout now. This is you know it, it's funny you know for years there's all, been all these video games and movies out about you know the fallout, the zombie nation, all this, and it's, it's almost funny now we're we're to that point because everybody's just like bunkered down in their house. Right. Um, did you? So how's the uh, how's the Nationals playing out so far? They won last night. <laughs> uh, it, it's weird. You know, I've been watching a couple games and there's uh-huh. no fans, but they pipe in noise. And if you're not paying attention, so if I'm looking down at my phone, the noise doesn't isn't always commensurate with what's going on in a game. So you're like, how did I miss that double? The noise, the, the fans didn't even do anything. You know, I I, th- I think what they should do is is to make the games more interesting. Now, is like put pictures of famous people up in the audience, like over the back fence, yeah. right? So you have like a picture of Trump, maybe Nancy Pelosi, you know, Trey Gowdy, you know, whoever, maybe movie stars. You'll put Kim Kardashian. So when they hit one of the dingers, right? If they hit one of the silhouettes. It counts as two runs. So, I mean, ah, make it interesting. Yeah. Let's make it right. interesting. You know, right. but let's see how good these guys are. Right. So, because right. it's right. not so enough of a funny football thing last night. Yeah, I know, right. <laughs> Lance, so they're, they're, they're playing Toronto. Right. Toronto's not allowed to play in Canada. So, Toronto <laughs> has to play their home games in the U.S. And, and course, I think there's uh, a. Problem. Wait, 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 stop. Of course, Toronto's not allowed to play in Canada. Right. <laughs> So, so I think they're working on a more permanent home stadium in Buffalo or some other city. Yeah. But, but the series with the Nationals is actually occurring in Washington. So Washington is playing an away game in their home stadium. So I was watching last night and trying to figure out how the, no- the noise would be piped in. Right. Is it if Toronto did well, would the noise be higher than if the Nationals did well? Sure. And couldn't figure anything out. But, <laughs> but it's or, would just, have uh, sli- or, or would the noise have a slight French accent? would be the right. the, the, the case. Right. And look, this, this is 2020. All, Anything goes. is possible. Le so, roar, le roar. Exactly. <laughs> le roar. So what's the latest on the Redskins now with the with the whole name change thing? Well, they're called the Washington football team now. That's and, the best they could come up with. No, here's the problem, and it makes sense. There's a ton of – Lance, you know this from – from what we've done, you can't get a dot com name and then you got all the copywriting and trademarking and, right. you know, all that stuff. So they didn't feel like they could rush it and get it in time for the new season. Right. So going with the Washington <laughs> football team. So go team. Go, go team. team. <laughs> and uh, I think by next season, they'll have a they'll be the Washington whatever's. Uh, there's <laughs> the, this is the Washington. Yeah. See, the Washington, you know, the Washington whatever's. Just perfect. <laughs> Jeez. It's just getting well, awesome. Well, uh, you know, if you're, if you're on this current projection on where things stand, right. I'm concerned that Washington is not going to be a valid name anymore because Washington owns slaves and right. they're going to. No, that's, uh, you know, trust me, that's, that's not, that's, so that's they're, very. They're it, <laughs> to Washington. So, you know, we'll see what they do. It's, you just may wind up being the whatevers. The whatever. And I'm <laughs> so, fine with that. Cause they play like the whatever. <laughs> so, all right. Well, you know, talk about another piece of absurdity here real quick. Kodak, Eastman Kodak, um, was a company that was trading roughly at $2 a share. Um, they actually do make products. They make some printers. They make printer ink. They do make digital cameras. Uh, you know, they of course, Co- Eastman Kodak was famous for their 35 millimeter film and all the stuff that they used to make back in the day. That isn't needed anymore uh, now that everybody uses their phones to take pictures. But um, over the last couple of days, uh, the stock's gotten a big boost. And and my question is, is who knew what when in Congress? Because some option traders made a killing on this um, because there was a big spike in, in call options on Eastman Kodak before the president announced that he would invoke the National Defense Act to get Kodak to make products for fighting the coronavirus. In the last three days, the stock went from $2 to $50 a share yesterday. It's been a huge windfall. If you have, you know, if anybody happened to be long $2 share Kodak, (laughs) which I'm not sure why anybody would, but whoever had it did very well here. But, you know, this is kind of an interesting thing. You know, all this is is the government gave them a, a grant, basically, that that ultimately is t- to make some product. But once they make this product, you know, what's going to, co- you, you know, what's going to, uh, is Kodak going to go back to doing, right? Well, what they were doing right. before. So, so I'm under the impression 
that Kodak. So one of the big issues that this country faces is that something like 75 to 80 percent of our critical drugs, however that's defined, right. are made in China. Right. That's a huge problem. You want to make your own critical drugs and you especially don't want to leave it up to a I don't know if they're an enemy, but they're not one of our best friends. Right. Right. So I guess the president decided Kodak, famous for their film and cameras, who actually I read this yesterday. And I don't remember the name, but they bought a pharmaceutical years ago right. for a huge amount of money and basically broke it up and sold it for nothing. They basically got fleeced in a pharmaceutical business. <laughs> I can't imagine Kodak, that would happen. <laughs> Kodak is apparently the right company for this. Yes. Instead of putting it out for the bid or, or going to a company that actually makes drugs and yep. knows how to make, drug, make drugs, yep. uh, Kodak's the one. So, yeah. so it, it got leaked, right? You could tell by the trading. It went from, like you said, it was like this range between a buck 50 and three, and it hit almost 50 yesterday. <laughs> Well, and again, this is you know this is very similar to the the all the congressmen that went out and bought right. work work at home stocks before the announcement of the shutdown in the economy. Right. You know, who would have known? You know, it's that's the big question. It's not 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 saying that insider trading doesn't happen in the White House it, it, or the you know Congress, right? It, it does, right? We are very aware of this, but you know the interesting thing you know, though is is that. You know, I guess now that they're getting, you know, you're converting Eastman Kodak into the next big pharmaceutical giant. The next step, this was a tweet that was out <laughs> yesterday that Cole was talking about. The next step is going to be, you know, basically they should start building rockets to Mars and, you know, electric cars. So, right. <laughs> I mean, this is and solar panels. I mean, that's all next, right? <laughs> no, but in all serious Lance, we talk about zombification, right? right? Where these companies that should be out of business are not let to go and those resources can't be spent on more productive, more inventive, better companies, right? right? This is happening all over again where instead of putting it with a company that's really good at innovation that could use some help that, that has a future, it's with basically a Hertz, a Chesapeake Energy, and we're seeing mm -hmm. the same ridiculous behavior in the stock uh, that we saw with those companies. Who knows how it ends, uh, but yeah. it's it's – not good for yeah. the economy. Well, you know, talking about zombie companies, um, Congress is now floating around an idea of another $500 billion bailout <clears throat> of the CMBS bond market. Um, can, so for, real quick here, we got about four minutes to the break. What is CMBS and why is the why is Congress talking about bailing it out? So just like the mortgage-backed security market where they take a bunch of mortgages, they put it into a security, someone guarantees that security, the mortgages, and then they sell it as one. So if you buy a mortgage-backed security, you're really buying the loans on 10,000 houses. So you have geographic diversification, house diversification. You really get a broad swath of an economy, mm -hmm. uh, different types of borrowers, uh, et cetera. This is the same thing but for commercial properties. Um, so instead of just buying one office building in Spokane, Washington, you're getting 100 office buildings or 100 restaurants or 100 commercial type properties scattered across the U.S. So so basically what government what Congress is doing here is they want to bail out the commercial real estate market where people have not been able, you know, businesses, uh, tenants, et cetera, aren't paying their rent because of where we right. are in the economy. So these bondholders are about to go into default in a lot of cases because, you know, people aren't paying the rent and aren't paying their mortgages, uh, their commercial, you know, mortgages, so to speak. And uh, so now we're talking about putting together another bailout here for the commercial side of the market. But, it, but again, this goes back to what you were saying a second ago. We're basically creating zombie companies that right. had gotten overextended, over leveraged, et cetera. Um, you know, building these properties, et cetera, and now they can't survive, you know, missing some payments. But, but Lance, they're not, they're not bailing out that, that uh, office building going out of business or the company that owns the office building going out of business. Mm -hmm. They're bailing out the investors that own those properties. That's right. Right, right. This is the same story over and over again. They're bailing out investors. Right. Investors that took risk knowingly that got paid a lot more than buying, you, you know, quote unquote, risk-free treasuries mm -hmm. got paid a lot more and now, you know, the 
things like this happen. You know, we do have recessions and that's why you get paid more to take that risk. And now they're getting bailed out, too, just like junk bond holders yeah. and everyone else. Well, let's be honest. We're bailing out pension funds that own them. We're bailing out Wall Street that owns them. We're bailing out everybody else that owns them. And what's interesting, though, is is it really doesn't solve the problem because the $500 billion is going in as a preferred stock position, which is junior to the actual debt position. So not only when ultimately these bonds default anyway— um, now, not only do the bonds default anyway, but now the taxpayers are on the hook because they're junior to the debt holders. They lose everything. So this 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 bailout ultimately goes to zero and is all on the back of taxpayers. And again, all we did was wind up was bailing out Wall Street, who uh, knew what they were getting into to begin with. So right, right, and commercial property has many problems. Facing exactly. It. Come back. Uh, we'll get into the Federal Reserve yesterday. Jerome Powell up on the Hill talking uh, about uh, the latest Fed policy action. No surprise. Didn't raise rates. Of course, he's never going to raise rates ever again. We'll talk about that when we come back in just a moment with Michael Leibowitz, CFA. Don't go away. Questions for Lance later? Ask now at realinvestmentadvice.com. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Lance Robert. So Mike and I are just talking off air here for a second. Some of the best conversations happen when we're not on the air. So we're talking about the election coming up. Mike says he's going to vote for his mom because if his mom wins, he gets to be Secretary of the Treasury. So, so I like this. This is a career path I can get behind. And, and Lance, yes. Lance becomes director of the fed chairman of the fed and brent if you play your cards right i can see director of communications i can do that yeah so you, you can be yeah. the white house spokesperson that's right there you go <laughs> uh i don't know you know brent is is actually is as much qualified as larry kudlow to be the national economic advisor so i think maybe <laughs> we'll put brent in charge of the is that economy left-handed compliment <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that didn't really actually come out the way I intended. Not quite sure how to take that. <laughs> I meant to try to slam Cutlow, but I think yeah. I actually got you instead. It kind of, it kind of la- thanks a lot. <laughs> kind of a <laughs> splash back on you. So anyway, uh, all right, let's talk about the Federal Reserve. Yesterday, uh, Jerome Powell announced that uh, shockingly, uh, they are not raising rates and that they stand ready with all of their tools and they're ready to do more if necessary. But interestingly enough, if you take a look at the programs that they've already done, right, uh, at this point, so the corporate bond purchase program, the Main Street lending programs, the PPP, all these programs that they're into, the uptake of these programs have not been terrific. Um, There's still a lot of room available uh, in these programs that – has not been has not been utilized yet um, by these various facilities, uh, and it's interesting because the demand, despite what we hear, that you know the economy is in the, these dire shambles and and the world's come to an end, so to speak. You know, you would expect these programs. There should have been a massive tidal wave of demand for these programs, but there really hasn't. So, I mean, how do you kind of explain that dichotomy? Uh- so I think what's going on, and again, I'm going to bring up my brother. We'll update everyone on my brother. <laughs> and he, he owns a printing press, and we've talked about him a couple times. And he was basically going into bankruptcy in March and April because he does printing, marketing, all the junk mail, you, at least in the Washington area. Oh, all the he's junk my favorite get, guy. <laughs> all the junk mail you get from real estate agents is coming from him. All right. <laughs> um, so that's him. So in March and April, he was doing next to nothing. But then the suburban housing market really picked up. And he also fired a lot of people. He took a PPP loan. And now I can't talk to him. He's so busy. He's, he's running around with his head chopped off because he has so much business now as one of his best Junes ever. So in that case, PPP really served its purpose. It got him over that chasm. It, he held on to, to a decent number of employees. And now he's up and running and doing good business. But there's a lot of people, you know, the restaurants are a great example. 
they're struggling mightily still. And they took the PPP loan. They kept people on staff, but for no purpose. And now I think they're looking at it and say, well, why do I? I can't. It, it has nothing to do with the money being available. There's no business here for me to do. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the problem is that the people like my brother don't need another loan. And then you got a whole group in the other camp that say, I'll take the money, but I got nothing to do with it. I don't have an underlying business. Right. And, and, that, that's, and that's very true. When we look at the the number of small businesses that are either close to filing for bankruptcy or have filed for bankruptcy, it's an alarmingly high uh, percentage of, of businesses that have now failed. And, you know, this is one of the things that we kind of continue to work through is is really, you know, does do these, you know, these trillions of dollars that we're throwing at the economy, you know, we're trying to solve a problem that was a de- we had a demand problem to start with. I mean, the economy was only growing at about two percent even going into this. And we were talking last year, you know, the inverted yield curve was already signaling there was economic trouble. The pandemic was just the trigger um, that caused this, you know, this kind of this bubble in the economy to pop, so to speak. And, you know, we're throwing money at it, trying to fix it, but you, you're you not fixing the underlying problem, which was there was too much debt, uh, not enough demand. And, and now we've kind of exacerbated that problem even more because we're not allowing the system to correct itself. Right. And we've made the problem worse in the future. Our economic growth, we've talked about this, Mm -hmm. will be much slower in the future because now we have to service all this debt. And instead of investing in things or buying things, whatever we want to do with that money, it's got to just pay off debt. And that's that's again, we're going to have slower growth and the Fed is just going to have to keep their foot on the pedal for eternity (laughs) yeah well that's that's the whole point and so you know when you listen to what jerome powell said yesterday uh, again really nothing surprising here because really what other choice did he have um you know if he he can't really come out and say look you know we've got a valuation problem in the market we've got um you know we've got distortions occurring in you know uh, asset markets that are dangerous to the overall economy he can't say any he can't he can't address any of these issues because it would actually create the exact effect that he doesn't want. Did you cause a big panic in stock? Stock prices fall. That impacts the economy, uh, reduces confidence. Um, so pretty much he's, he's trapped into where he is now and really has no choice to try to normalize, you know, the, you know their policy relative to, uh, to the economy to actually create some organic growth down the road. Which is funny because it's really a bad circular loop. Mm-hmm. He's trying to get policy to for the economy, but he, at the same time, they're hurting the economy and then they're providing more policy to hurt the economy. And he's just creating this horrendous feedback loop that's going to end with a natural growth rate of zero. Right. Well, yeah, and we've we've seen this in other countries as well. I mean, we're, 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 you know, we're following the exact same path that Japan has tried. And, you know, the, the comments always come out says, well, you know, Japan is, is, you know, they're, they, they've done all this and, you know, they're not dead yet. They're close, <laughs> but yeah, they're, and, and they're not dead Japan yet. Japan has the same GDP today as they had in the late '90s. <laughs> exactly, and that's and that's and that's the problem with this. But you know, we're trying to solve short-term problems without understanding the long-term consequences. Instead of accept, you know, look, this, this is terrible to say, right? That you know, we would have to hurt people, but you you've got to some point, you've got to make that decision to allow companies to fail. You've got to allow people to, you know file for bankruptcy and do these type of things so that they can resolve themselves of the debt. And then importantly, like we were talking about the CMBS, just a second ago, the commercial um, mortgage-backed security market that Congress now wants to bail out. At some point, you have got to let investors take the damage for the risk that they took. They right. took risk in the they took risk in the stock market. They took risk in the bond market. They knew what the risk were going in. At some point, you've got to let them take take kind of quote unquote take their lumps because you've got to resolve that debt issue. But we won't do that because we're so afraid of hurting Wall Street or the individual person or whatever it is. We got to keep you know propping all these things up. But the long term damage is potentially you know it's 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 death by a thousand cuts, right? It's it's you know a long term slow torture that gets you to the same position, it's just going to take longer to get there. Right, right. And at the same time, and we just wrote about it, is you're destroying the capital markets, which is one of the the main arteries, lifelines for capitalism. 
right? If you, uh, like one of our examples was corporate bond spreads. Mm -hmm. So when we say corporate bond spreads, we say that's basically the difference between the yield on a corporate bond versus the yield on a quote unquote risk-free treasury. And when things are good, the economy's running, companies are doing well, that spread is small, it's tight because investors don't need much to be compensated for the risk they're taking. And conversely, as you kind of approach recessions and during recessions, the spread widens out because investors want to be compensated for potential losses, but loss of earnings, that type of thing. And that has, you know, if you go back through history, that's what happens with corporate bond spreads. They widen out or they, they get bigger during recessions. And when the time when things are good, they get tighter. Well, if you look at them this time, they're just about as tight as they've ever been, yet we're in an economic recession, maybe a depression, where we couldn't be more uncertain certain about the future. And, uh, you know, uh, we wrote something to the effect that bond, bond yield spreads are about as certain about the future as they can be while the economy is and people are completely uncertain about the future. And that's just a divergence like we've never seen, but it sends the wrong signals to the market, to the economy. All right, we'll come back from the break. We'll wrap up, uh, talk a little bit about where we are in the markets, a little bit about gold and the dollar, and um, also uh, an update on this hurricane. Uh, is it Isaias? Is that how you pronounce it? I don't know where they come up with these names. Like, what, what happened to Joe or Tom or Bill? Okay, first of all, hurricanes are always named after females. Okay, what happened to Josephine and <laughs> Thomasina and Billy? <laughs> But, yeah, uh, interesting story. I actually have a relative that's trapped, and we'll talk about that when we go back after the break. Real Investment Show podcasts are now available on iTunes. Listen any place, anytime at iTunes.com. Everybody get up! So, uh, welcome back this morning. I'm your host, Lance Roberts. <clears throat> so, so, I just realized this a moment ago. As uh, we were getting ready to wrap up the last segment, I happened to glance up and they have a hurricane tracking chart of this hurricane ICA. However you pronounce it, I, I Is It's three yeah, syllables. It's crazy. Okay, if you drop the A, it's ISIS. Okay, so <laughs> that's that's where we are with this thing. Hurricane ISIS. <laughs> so it's 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 so it's coming up mm -hmm. and it's heading right through kind of the the the, the Cayman Islands, right? Yeah. So and one of the islands that's right in its path is Turks and Caicos. Yes. Which um, you know I've talked about this before. My my family and I we go we used to go there. A couple of years ago, pretty regularly to dive. We haven't we haven't got a chance to go back in the last year or so, but we like to go there and dive. It's beautiful and you know fish, do some stuff. But my wife was telling me day before yesterday that her brother, who lives in Austin, he's weird. Um, <laughs> just saying, he can hang Keep out. With weird. He can hang out with Joe Rogan coming up here pretty quick. Um, but he took his family over to Turks and Caicos. So this was last. It was, it was earlier this week, right? I think it was on Monday. They left and they went to Turks and Caicos, and mm -hmm. they were going to have vacation there, mm -hmm. uh, get ready to wrap up. So they get to Turks and Caicos, and Turks and Caicos says, "Welcome to Turks and Caicos. You're in quarantine for 14 days before we'll allow you out on our island. There's government housing. We'll put you in that for 14 days, and you have to pay for it. By the way." You have to pay for your housing while you're locked up in quarantine. And once you get through quarantine, you're welcome to enjoy the island of Turks and Caicos. He's there yeah. in quarantine. The hurricane is headed directly to him. So I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know if they're going to let him out of quarantine to send him back home. The Roberts family vacation curse No, no, no. He's not, he's not a Roberts. He's your, your wife's. He's, he's my brother-in-law. He's not, a, he's not a Roberts. It so. extends. <laughs> It extends. All right. So he's weird. You can't make those things up. No, I, I can't, you can't. But I, I don't know what's going to happen now, but he's locked up in quarantine. <laughs> and, and I mean, if they let him out, will he infect the hurricane? I mean, that's the other problem. So, you know. And then I, it'll spread all over Florida. Exactly. That's a big problem. <laughs> 
He may not be allowed to come back home. I know. He may not be able to. This is going to be the, the, the question. So wow. we'll, we'll see and what happens. he'll be in quarantine here once he gets home. So for, yes, he will. If, and if I could pronounce the name of the hurricane, I would. But uh, I say yes, or it's ISIS. Come yeah, on, let's, yeah, just, let's just go with it. Um, all right. I think, I, think this was somebody, I think somebody came up with this, like, Hurricane ISIS. And there was, we can't say that. Stick an A in the middle of it. <laughs> make up a new word. We do it all the time anyway now. We just make up new words for websites. <laughs> anyway. Uh, all right, Mike, uh, back to uh, reality here for a second. Uh, a couple of things that are going on with the markets. Um, you know, we're, th- this week is the big peak in, in kind of the S&P earnings announcements. Uh, tech stocks are all going to announce after the bell today. Um you know, earnings are beating estimates, not surprising because we lowered them so much. But one of the interesting things that, you know, we've touched on is what's happening with the dollar and what's happening with gold. Big spike in gold here recently. And my concern is when you start hearing about it on CNBC, you know, 12 hours a day about the price of gold, um, it's probably time to take some money out of out of the position and, and maybe kind of rethink the position, at least uh, temporarily. Same thing goes with the dollar uh, pretty much all day long on you know, the media channels, it's the demise of the dollar, the dollar's going lower. Uh, As soon as the Fed made their announcement yesterday is that, you know, the Fed announcement drives the dollar even lower. I mean, everybody's got this focus on the dollar. We're about to lose reserve currency status, Um, you know, but we're actually building a long position in the dollar right now because of of this extreme. Yep. Right. And look, I'm our resident gold bug. Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, 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 you know, a few few days ago, we, uh, you know, I brought up selling a little bit of our gold, taking some profits because, uh, you know, like you said, Lance, it's been tied to the dollar. Mm-hmm. But so has stocks and bonds and everything has been tied to the dollar. So what you what what we have to consider is the dollar is just not the dollar on its own. It's the dollar euro, the dollar yen, the dollar index, which is against a basket of currencies. Mm-hmm. And so let's just think about uh, dollar euro, because that's that's one of the more important uh, crosses. The, the euro is starting to bump up against some significant levels. The euro euro region has deflationary problems. The stronger the euro gets the more deflation they start importing. Mm-hmm. So the question is not necessarily how weak can the dollar get, is how much further will the Europeans allow the euro to rise? And then you can extract that question around the world. You got the same thing with the Ch- Chinese yuan. Mm-hmm. It's starting to hit some major support too on the upside. Uh, the yen has been really strong. Um, so so it's a question of the dollar and how weak are we letting going to let it go. And and that's inflationary, which is what the Fed wants. Mm -hmm. But it's the exact opposite for every other country. And and what we're seeing now is is not unprecedented, but the correlation or the negative correlation between the dollar and all these asset classes all at once. Stocks, bonds, gold, Mm -hmm. commodities, you name it, are all the, 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 the correlation is very high. Right. So it, it feels like something is getting ready to snap because it's not just one market, one sector. It's it's so many different things. Right. Well, and again, it, it's it's, you know, and the other thing, too, is just remember is that nothing moves in one direction. And, you know, the extension, you've got such negative sentiment on the dollar. You've got such bullish sentiment on gold. You've got uh, the, you know, extremely bullish sentiment on on stocks. Um, you know, it, it doesn't matter real commodities. You've got, you know, you, you take a look at a chart of copper or lumber, the, you know, type of thing. They've just gone vertically. You know, they've gone parabolic, uh, kind of in a vertical spike. And those things never last long historically, and you're going to have a retracement. I'm not, and, and we're, and just to be clear, we're not saying that the dollar is about to rally at all time highs, and and you know this is you know going to be the change dynamic. We're simply saying that we're probably going to get a reflexive bounce in the dollar that will allow us to buy our gold position back cheaper than it is now. Um, and I shouldn't say buy back. All we did was trim it. We still own gold, but we'll you know we'll add more to our position on on a pullback in in that. Um, will you know b- uh, buy back into the international markets potentially? You know we took that trade off the table as well because that's impacted by the do- the value of the dollar as well. So, you know we're you know all we're doing is repositioning risk in our portfolios. But whenever you get these extremes, 
you know, this is the time that people tend to make investment mistakes by going, oh, I got to go buy gold. I can't tell you how many emails I've gotten just in the last week about is now the time to buy gold. No, the time to buy gold was, you know, a year and a half ago when we were buying gold at the end of our portfolios, when it was first showing some signs of life after three years of doing nothing. Um, that was the time to buy gold. Now is the time to start thinking about taking gold off the table. But, you know, this is the historical tendency of investors and why investors wind up losing money over time because they buy the most at the top and the least at the bottom. As right, Bob Carroll, right. I, mean, I used to say. It, it kind of feels like a Kodak moment, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> what, do you buy Kodak today? No, the time to buy Kodak was 20 minutes before they got that loan from the government. Exactly. And if you'd only right. known, like the CEO of Kodak knew. <laughs> you, unlike you Kodak, <laughs> unlike Kodak, we are we are allowed to know some information, right? right? And we do see all these markets and the way they react together. So, you know, keep a close eye on the dollar index, keep a close eye on these other markets, and you're going to watch. It, and it, look, Lance, too, the other side is the dollar could really break down from here, too. Right. The trend could just get it, you know, just keep going, which then poses a lot of problems for the rest of the world, but also the United States. So, you well, know, there's a number of things that can happen, and we're not saying it's, you know, the dollar may just consolidate for six months and go nowhere, or may bounce, and then then probe new lows. Right. But it, it feels like something's getting ready to kind of snap across all markets. And it doesn't mean it's bad or good. It just, you know, yeah. it's something to consider well, and, and, and risk appropriately. Well, and this is also a nightmare for Jerome Powell, going back to the Fed here for a second, because a big collapse in the dollar at this point would really put a, a big impact on their their capability to do more things like more QE, more of this, more of that, because of the relative inflationary pressures that would come from a collapse in the dollar. And, and plus, a, a weak dollar is not good for the economy, right? You know, we always, you know, even President Trump, when he was elected, he's like, hey, we need to get our dollar stronger. We need to bring stuff back to America and, and be, you know, be great again. Um you know, a, a, a stronger dollar is better for the economy than a weaker dollar. So this is potentially, you know, everybody's asking, you know, everybody kind of believes that no matter what happens, the Fed can control the markets. But what the Fed can't control is their ability to to support markets if something gets out of control. And that would be a collapsing dollar, a big spike in inflation. And that's kind of what, and to your point, that's kind of where we are. So either we better start manipulating currency here soon or the Fed's going to have a problem. Well, what's interesting <laughs> is a day or two ago, the Fed came out and said that they're going to renew the foreign currency swaps out till March of uh, 2021. Right. So the foreign currency swaps basically allow a foreign central bank, instead of going to the market and buying dollars, which would push up the price of dollar, going to the Fed. So I, I'm just wondering if the Fed is a little concerned that the dollar is going to sna snap back pretty strongly mm -hmm. and which will then create demand from all these foreign central banks for dollars and become a positive feedback loop for the dollar. So they, they went ahead now and extended those programs so that if the dollar really comes back strongly mm -hmm. and quickly. And remember, in March, it was up 10 points, which for our currency is a lot right. uh, in a matter of two weeks. So I just wonder if uh, Chairman Powell is kind of trying to stay ahead of that one. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, all right. So uh, as we get ready to kind of close up the shop for the day for this Thursday edition, uh, any quick closing thoughts, Mike, on uh, what we should be looking out for here? Uh, just, you know, again, it's not just one market. It's all markets. Keep an eye on the dollar. Keep an eye on yields. Keep an eye on gold. Keep an eye on stocks because they're all traveling in the same direction. So as long as nobody gets out of the car, we're OK. Bingo. <laughs> so, and that's no the rest hope. stops. That's the hope anyway. All right. So after the bell today, lots of big earnings come out from the big tech companies. That is probably going to set the tone for the markets tomorrow for certain. Um, but also, too, just kind of keep a watch, as, as Mike said, on, on kind of where things are. Everybody's very, very bullish right now in markets. You know, we, we took, a lot, uh, took a look at our positioning gauges last week on the show. You know, those are all pushing up into kind of the greed section of, of the analysis. So, you know, we're back to that point of where markets are very extended. Option, uh, option uh, traction on, on tech stocks is at all-time highs. Last time we saw that was back in January of this year. And you know what happens next. And remember, it's, it's not about what causes, what the ultimate catalyst is for the downturn in the markets. It's always something that we don't expect. It's something that's exogenous. It's something that the markets aren't predicting, like the pandemic in March. But what we have is we have all the ingredients 
for a, a, a very sharp correction in the markets because of all the exuberance. All you need ultimately is some exogenous trigger to cause it to happen. What that's going to be, nobody knows, and we never know what it is until it happens. But that's why you want to be alert, manage your risk a bit. That's what Mike and I were just talking about. You know, take some exposure off the table, raise a little bit of cash, position yourself potentially for uh, something that could happen in the next month or two, which historically kind of aligns with August and September, which tend to be seasonally weak anyway. So get by our website, get our latest newsletter, our updates, our technically speaking post. Mike's article out yesterday on the Fed, all on the website now, realinvestmentadvice.com. And check out our subscriber service, riapro.net. Check out our portfolios and more, realinvestmentadvice.com. Have a great day. Chris Salcedo is coming right up. It's a rich man's world.